Howdy folks, Jamboreeki here. I have decided to start over. Let's refurbish the Tone Pod show. Let's do something completely different. I want this series to be exciting. I want it to be fun for me to do so I can get into doing it more frequently. So, I want this series to be more like a variety show. A bit like this uh, radio program I grew up with as a kid called Steve Wright in the Afternoon. It would have a variety of different things. And to start off the show, I would like to talk about cartoons I've seen recently. Now, I've only seen one cartoon recently, as far as I can recall, and that show is The Cramp Twin. Now, for those of you who don't know what The Cramp Twins is, it's a cartoon that's focused on the adventures of a pair of non-identical twins, Lucian and Wayne. Now, Wayne is more crazy and nuts, while Lucian is peaceful, gentle, sensible, and has a love for nature. What I love about this show mainly is the character of Wayne. He's just so insane and crazy, but at the same time, there's a passion. He has so much fun causing trouble, he has so much fun irritating his brother and beating up his brother, and yeah, he's a dick, but he's a lovable dick. He's got the same kind of charm as, say, Eric Cartman. He's really self-involved, but there's a fascination that I have with his self-involvement. His indulgence is really interesting. I, I just, I really love that he has a hobby. He has a passionate hobby with garbage. He adores garbage. It's like he sees it as an escape from his home because his mom is completely obsessed with cleaning and so I think that psychologically he's seeing the garbage as a way to escape from the cleanliness and the restrictions of his house. I think one of the things that really stands out about the Cramp Twins is the adult characters. They are messed up. They are really, really messed up. I can't believe the kind of things that the Cramp Twins teacher kind of gets away with sometimes, and uh, even attempts to do. The kind of punishment she wants to do against kids she doesn't like. And her behavior, her attitude is really scarily unprofessional, and like, ooh, it's, it's really creepy. But at the same time, I think that just adds to the show and gives it this really weird atmosphere, this really strange and harsh tone that kind of works for some reason, because it's so odd, it's a very odd show, and that's the novelty of it, is its strangeness. That's all I can really say about the Cramp Twins, it's very entertaining, very strange, and very fun. Moving on, it's time for trivia. Trivia time! Let's begin. The creator of Hey Arnold, Craig Bartlett, is married to Matt Groening's sister, Lisa Groening, the inspiration for Lisa Simpson. One of the first actors to provide the voice of Minnie Mouse was Marcelite Garner, an artist who worked in Disney's ink and paint department. Hmm. When Mike Myers was recording the romantic lines in the finale of Shrek, he was actually reading opposite his wife. How sweet is that? <laughs> The members of the parody rock band Spinal Tap, Harry Shearer, Michael McKean, and Christopher Guest provided the voice of the Gorgonites in Small Soldiers. Almost like a reunion there. And that's all the trivia I'm going to give for this episode. I will provide more in future episodes. Moving on, it's time for an animation-related quiz. That's right, and I've got a special guest contestant joining me. So, joining me for a quiz is Mr. Reverse Soda. Hello, Reverse. Hi, what's up? <laughs> so, I <laughs> was not expecting that kind of voice coming from you. <laughs> right? Join me by surprise. So, you run a YouTube channel. What do you do on your YouTube channel? I'm a voice actor, and I'm just a, just, just a guy that makes videos, that's all. Just, just what, make what kind laugh. of What kind of videos? Parodies, the bridge, music. Oh, I see yeah. Let's play. Awesome. 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 How consistent are you with these videos? Make videos like once every three months. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. That's really consistent, man. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> That's a great routine. <laughs> Definitely. It's just I'm so I'm so busy with everything in my life right now. I don't really have time to do YouTube stuff right now. But I'm coming back in the summer, so I'm gonna be like packing with new stuff. So look forward to that. <laughs> I really want people to know that I'm actually 
into you know voice acting. So <clears throat> I'm more of a voice acting person. So that's what I'm really known for as River Soda. I'm a voice actor that does like teenage voice and very big minana or top hamburg corner. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Todd Hammer Corner. <laughs> <laughs> it's his evil doppelganger. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay, so we're going to jump into a quiz, and Mr. Reverse Odra is going to be our contestant. It's a Disney themed quiz. How confident are you about Disney? Very confident. I know my friend's answer. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. You're super ready. I'm ready, ready. Oh, wow. Ready, ready. Oh, ready, that's, ready. that's great. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> question one. What fruit does Shrek. the wiki... Mm-hmm. Got that right. Let's move on. You're psychic. <laughs> no. <laughs> what fruit does the wicked queen use to kill Snow White? An apple. Correct. I was going to say orange, but I wasn't really sure. <laughs> <laughs> the genie from Aladdin is voiced by which comedian? Um, um, ah, uh, I know his name. Uh, pressure um oh, he plays flubber uh i forgot his name i forgot his name <laughs> crap he's so is easy that, huh is that a pass no <laughs> you uh, determined <laughs> oh i just had it too and now i just forgot it you know i'll just pass okay <laughs> yeah the answer was robin williams robert williams yeah fuck. which, <laughs> which fuck. animal taunts the villain as captain hook in peter pan i don't know no ideas? No ideas. You want to phone a friend? <sighs> okay, I'll call my mom. <laughs> the answer was crocodile. Oh, crocodile. Right, next question. Name the fairies in Sleeping Beauty. One point per fairy. Oh, Sleeping Beauty, right? Yeah. Uh, fairies. Red, blue, green. That's all I want to say. <laughs> I don't Not know. Power it Rangers. <laughs> 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 I honestly don't know. My team morphing fairies. Do, 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 do. I would I would love to see that on the Disney Channel. <laughs> My team we can make that happen. Fairies. We can make that happen. I can draw I it out. <laughs> I, I really love to see you do a webcam comic called Mighty Morphing Fairies. <laughs> and it has to be the fairies from Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> I wanna see this. So are you passing this one? No. No, you're determined. I'm de- uh, Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, I'm passing this. <laughs> I thought I, th- I thought you said, like, are you winning? Like, no. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Right, the answer was Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I, that, that I would not know. Next question. The sequel to The Rescuers is set in which country? Africa? No, incorrect. The answer was Australia. A boy called Pete owns what kind of fantasy creature in this Disney movie from the 70s? Oh, really? I don't know. A pass. Pass. The answer was dragon. Oh, I never heard of it. <laughs> it's dragon. It's a little boring, but it's got its charm. Anyway, next question. Oliver and Company is a loose adaptation of which book? The Fox's Hound. No. <laughs> what? The fox is hound? I just the guess. Is... <laughs> I don't know. I gotta fox... say something because I keep saying pass. You didn't even stop to think about that one. You just threw a really badly titled <laughs> version of an actual Disney film. The fox is hound. A fox owns a hound. <laughs> it was the inspiration for Oliver and Company. <laughs> No, the answer was uh, Oliver Twist. Man, I don't know this. <laughs> you said you were confident. I'm confident with the recent Disney's, not the seven. <laughs> Flight of the Navigator is an animated film about a girl's quest to become a pilot. True or false? Mm, don't have to guess this one. False. It's correct. It's actually about a little boy that goes on a ship. He travels back in time 
I'm, I'm giving a really loose description for what it's about. I'm kind of on the spot about that. Anyway. That's good, because I, I want to know. I don't know them. It's worth going seeing. It's, it's a pretty fun movie. Uh, okay, so the next question is, name the hyenas from The Lion King. One point per answer. The one who laughs a lot, the one who's cool, and the one who's just really weird. No, no, their names, not the character synopsis. <laughs> oh, man. It's been so long since I watched that movie. I'm going to have to say pass because I don't remember the name anymore. Pass. Okay, the answer was Shenzi, Banzai, and Ed. <laughs> Ed, of course. Ed. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really rubbish Jim Cummings attempt. <laughs> right, the next question. Poor Unfortunate Souls is a song sung by which Disney villain? Poor... Uh, Poor Unfortunate Souls. Feels like I know this, i just not sure. Nah, I gotta say a pass, because I don't know this one. Okay, the answer was Ursula. <sighs> Poor Unfortunate Souls. It's a good thing, because I, I was going to say... I was gonna say, uh, what's, um, uh, Cinderella, but that wasn't that it. Cinderella. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> because, because she, she, you know, she's like. I said villain. I made it quite obvious it was a villain. <laughs> oh, villain. I didn't Cinderella. hear villain. I did not hear villain, dude. <laughs> Pay attention, or you're gonna end up saying Cinderella for everything. <laughs> Next question. Name all the members of the recess gang. One point per answer. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna pass because I don't know. <laughs> Remember? You don't know. You've not seen recess. I haven't seen recess since in a decade, man. Oh really? It's worth going back to watch it. It's actually a good show. So yeah, that's a pass. No points. <laughs> <sighs> and then the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Quasimodo is friends with a group of what? The trolls. Do you, do you, I don't know the name. <laughs> <laughs> you, it was like you were just you were just gasping to try and grab onto any answer all quick. No, no, I, d- n- drowning. <laughs> it's funny too because I'm going to be voicing them in my bridge in my next episode of Bridge all too. All right. Yeah. And you didn't know what they were the gargoyles. The gargoyles, yeah. They're gargoyles, only... and you're you're attached to do the their voices and then the bridge. What what? Right, next question. Watch out for that tree is a catchphrase from which Disney movie? George in the Jungle. Correct! Dude, my first correct answer. Yay! Actually, you got, you got two others correct so far, so you got uh-huh. three points so far. Well done. Which Disney characters make a cameo in Frozen? Oh, character. Uh, uh, Rapunzel. And? Oh, Flynn? Yes, correct. Yay! Well done! Woohoo! Roll on a roll! <laughs> Yay! Bill Collins did original songs for which two Disney movies? A point per answer. Bill Collins. Hmm. Wait, you said music or? Songs. Songs. Um. Feels like he did Tarzan, did he? Yeah, that's one. That's all I know. <laughs> You're just gonna take that then? Uh, I'm gonna take it and leave it. So the answer was Tarzan and Brother Bear. In the Emperor's New Groove, the character Cusco is turned into what kind of animal? A freaking awesome llama? <laughs> it's like you sounded confident and nervous at the same time. I was gonna say alpaca. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna say alpaca, but uh, I just stopped myself. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay, yes, that was the correct answer. Despite how much you stuttered it. <laughs> what are the monsters from Monsters Inc. collecting from the children? Scares. Spooks? Incorrect. Incorrect. Oh, well. <laughs> the answer was screams. Ah. Oh, still the same. I don't care a damn. <laughs> <laughs> Walt Disney died during the production of which movie? <clears throat> um. Oh. Uh. Beauty and the Beast? Incorrect. He oh. was dead by then, for sure. It was, the answer was The Jungle Book. Really? Yes. Oh. He died that long ago, yeah. Right. Which American state is Lilo and Stitch set in? Hawaii. Yeah, correct. <laughs> 103 Dalmatians is a straight-to-video Disney sequel. True or false? False? 
That is correct. It does not exist. Surprisingly. Yeah, that, that <laughs> like, it took me a while. To, like, I was going to say true. But uh, and, and, it does then, sound almost legit. <laughs> yeah. And you then, wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, and then I did this thing called thinking, and <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, next question: In Finding Nemo, the character Dory suffers from what condition? Short-term memory. Yes. Well done. That is correct. Fill in the blank. In Ratatouille, Remy the Rat wants to become a professional what? Super up and chef. That is correct. Yes. What big festive event takes place in the finale of Princess and the Frog? I haven't seen that movie, so I, I, I'll pass. Oh, that's <clears throat> misfortunate. Yeah, yeah. The answer was Mardi Gras. Oh. So I've rounded up all your correct answers, and I now have an official result. Are you ready? Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> you scored. A whopping 9 out of 23! Yeah, that's a record! <laughs> that is definitely a record. <laughs> well, uh, Reverse Soda, thank you for joining in for this fun little quiz. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Uh, uh, fun. Right, moving on to the final part of the show. I'm going to interview a special guest animator. That's right, this guy is called Jeffrey James, and he has worked on such films as Mulan, Balto, Help I'm a Fish, and many different Don Bluth productions. Welcome to the show, Jeff, and my first question is this. You have animated a lot of animal characters. Is it difficult to do that? I mean, they walk on all fours and they have fur. I can imagine that being really hard to work with. I think that the... I actually love doing dogs because I worked on the Fox and the Hound, and so I guess I've had a lot of experience on quadrupeds. So I, I do like those. I mean, the only challenges have to do with how you're going to how the character's designed or the the mouth shapes, you know, and, and things like that. You have to come up with ways to not necessarily humanize them, but use expressions and try to, uh, try to you know, put that character in there. Um, but I actually get a kick out of, you know, animals as much as humans, yeah. I think animals seem really hard to animate. I've never tried it before. Yeah, I, I'm, I personally love it. I mean, I do. I mean, obviously with humans, it's more... Uh, restrictive because you you can be you has to be because people know what humans you know nobody's seen talking dogs or talking fish so you can sort of you have a little bit of liberty there but especially in two two D drawings but with uh, humans as you know everybody knows how a human is so depending on whether the style is really broad or if it's very subtle then it's very difficult. Has there ever been an animal that you found really difficult? You know, one that you found really challenging. Hmm. I mean, I did a massive gal alligator in All Dogs Go to Heaven, um, which was kind of tough. A porcupine was real. I remember doing a scene, some scenes of the porcupine and the fox and the owl when I was a kid, and all those quills, you know, moving up and down. It was just like really frustrating. That was that was hard to manage. I think. I, I think anytime you have like layers upon layers, or if a character is very has a lot of dense, like a. Uh, you know, it's, it's harder to articulate sometimes things that have, you know, like fur, a lot of fur is hard to work with, you know, as well. Well, plus if it's, you know, when you're doing 2D animation, I mean, you have to sort of project into the cleanup stage. So you're, you're trying to get the inner workings of the character, but then if it has, you know, floppy ears or long fur or, or, you know, or like if it's like has a lot of flesh or like a, like a bloodhound or something, you sort of have to work to the, all the way, see, see how far it's going to go because obviously the labor intensiveness is tr in trying to get those secondary actions to work in detail and cleanup is, is, a, is a lot of work, you know. So you prefer to work with animated characters that have simple designs? Well, I mean, when I, I remember, I mean, the thing is, is that at Disney in the old days, you used to, well, they used to have, you'd be sort of doing, um, uh, you had a, you had the rough animation and you'd do all that and you'd break it down. I, I, I sort of, when I worked with Don Bluth, I sort of had to learn to, to draw tighter, draw cleaner. So my roughs were much more, I'd do it in blue and I'd actually really sort of tie it down and, and it'd get it to the point where it's almost like all the cleanup person had to do is, you know, put a black line on it, you know. So, but, um, but nowadays, I mean, they have a, they have a different system. It's like, I, I remember on Mulan with, you know, uh, 
uh, Mark Hen did this, you know, did tons of footage, and he was very loose, but he had a wonderful assistant who could follow up after him and get all the get all the details and still keep the timing. So he, uh, in 2D, you really have to have a good assistant and, and a good team following you up. So how important would you say it is for an animator to have a good relationship with their assistant? Well, it depends on how you work. I mean, some guys, I mean, I remember there, uh, one of the old, first, one of the old guys that I worked with was named, his name was Cliff Nordberg. And I mean, I, his, his animation was extremely rough, but he had a assistant, Leroy, that was just somehow he knew how to translate his stuff and he could just turn it into these beautiful drawings. But I mean, uh, so yeah, so you have to have a good relationship with your assistant, but not everybody can like, you know, people like Richard Williams, he's, they're brilliant draftsmen or, you know, or, or there's, there's guys that are, you know, like John Pomeroy or Ken Duncan who are like just amazing draftsmen and Glenn Keane who they can, you know, so, but I think the better you are, you know, at both, animation and drawing the best better your animation turns out because then you're not totally dependent but it's more of a collaborative effort with the with the assistant now you served as a supervising animator for more than one character on mulan was it difficult doing that many characters as a supervising animator i mean i'll be honest i was i was envious that uh you know that I didn't just have one character i mean you know but uh, cuz that would be that would be the perfect you know actor's dream is just to have one character but then you know you sort of it's i guess it's a little bit like what um i mean i was always impressed with uh oh, what's his name i can't remember his name now uh, who did um did you ever see uh, did you ever see um uh, oh gosh oh, i can't remember it now it was a brilliant peter sellers when he would do those multiple characters in one film like you know to me it's a uh, that, that's Doctor Strangelove, where he played, what, four characters or three characters, and, you know, I think that's actually amazing when people can do that, you know. I totally agree. I think it's quite an achievement for an actor to be that versatile. Well, and that's what was great about Mulan, is that I had two polar opposite characters. Here you have this sinister, devious character that would basically, uh, I think I had a quote, I said he, he hurts others to justify himself, and, 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 but he's just terrible. He was like, every, he was the worst of anybody I ever knew. That you know, I would kind of pick the tip. He was sort of like the, the office bureaucrat who would stab you in the back. You know, to further his career, further his career. And in fact, at one point, um, he got so he was getting, so much sort of attention that, Michael Eisner. I remember in one meeting he said, you know, we got to decide whether we're gonna, we have to pull back on Chifu because it takes away from Shan Yu, the villain. So. So uh, we've met, kept him more of a comic, bumbling idiot, sort of like you'd find in, you know, on a TV show. But with Grandma, she was like the sweet, sort of sarcastic, you know, old lady who could, you know, basically fart in public and nobody would care, you know, sort of cute, you know. So that was nice to be able to stretch and see if you could do both, you know. Ah, right. So despite being envious of those doing one character, you still embrace the challenge of doing two characters. I like that. <laughs> okay, next I want to ask you about Don Bluth. What was it like working with this legend? Well, I think Don, I, I, I met Don the very first day I was recruited at Disney, so I knew him since I was 21, and um, he was really amazingly encour encouraging to young artists, and um, so I actually even started working with him after work when I was at Disney and on the weekends on his first uh, short film, Banjo, The Woodpile Cat, so I would go there at 7 o'clock and work till 10 or 11 and come home and then go to Disney and then on Saturday or Sunday I'd go there and work on the film and do animation and so he was, and that's kind of the way he was, he was trying to further animation which was really exciting um, and then of course when I, he left and then I stayed at Disney and then when I went to Europe in the 80s and started working, um, then he knew I was there because we kept in touch. And he had come to Denmark a few times when I was living there. And so uh, he asked me to join when he went at the end of Land Before Time. So um, then we struck up a relationship. I mean, we've just known each other. As a matter of fact, I, I was at his house a couple of years ago in Phoenix, you know, and we just chatted for about three hours about stuff. And he was just a great, he's very encouraging. I mean, I think the problem was is that in the old days, back in the late 70s, early, he was sort of ran, butted heads against some of the CalArts art animators that came in. 
And I think that because he came from a different, he came up through the school of sort of hard knocks, you know, being an in-betweener on Snow White and working on Sword in the Stone and then getting into the animation industry more seriously at Filmation in the late, uh, in the late 60s and going into the 70s. Uh, getting finally getting returning to Disney in '71. So, and these guys the, the, from Cal Arts, uh, I didn't go to call a school there, but I mean they came from where they had a chance to learn about filmmaking, not just animation. So, I think they 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 just didn't get along. So, what would you say personally is the thing that makes Don Bluth unique compared to other animation directors? <sighs> Well, I mean, first of all, he practically boarded all of his own movies. I mean, except for the very end when Dan Kenster did a big chunk of them, like, you know, All Dogs Go to Heaven. He, did, he would do a lot of sequences. But Don mostly boarded almost everything, pretty much. I mean, he was... He, but And he would board with the layouts and everything. So, I mean, it was, I mean he, would, he would expect you to even use the poses that he had on there almost verbatim. So he was more hands-on. I, I think he sort of took his animation experience and put it into the boarding process and for better or worse I think that was the uh, that was the way he worked whereas other directors especially at Disney you know that they're more direct from uh, uh, from a, a distance so they try to keep their objectivity both in story and I mean Don would never really change once he once he boarded it he would never change it he might change it in the editing or, or you know, or Gary Goldman, his partner, might do something. They might shift things around a little bit, but pretty much all the cutting, it was pretty much already, that's the way he wanted it, you know. Ah, I see. So he's more interactive compared to other animation directors you've worked with. Oh, absolutely. I mean, even the animation. I mean, since he was a, a, a very accomplished animator himself, and, you know, he would go on, and he was very, you know, particular about the backgrounds but that's because he also the layout you know he could paint he was a sort of a he's kind of a renaissance man you know he loves putting on plays to even today he likes doing you know little plays in his house and all kinds of stuff like that yeah he actually has a, a stage he has a little theater in his home you know so he puts on little plays and things like that and and he loves it i mean he's a good guy though he actually is he you know i i, I still attribute the 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 uh, Renaissance or the second golden age of animation to his ability to take that risk and go out there and make the secret of Nim, because I think it really proved, uh, you know, fun fundamentally that somebody besides Disney could do a to, could do a feature film of a significant quality. Yeah, what I like is that a lot of Don Bluth movies open up with a Don Bluth film. Now, this is something that usually a lot of live action movies start off with in the credits, but I guess this proves how powerful Bluth's name is when you put it in the credits, compared to other animation directors. Well, that's all we have time for. Thank you for joining me, Jeffrey. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. I've been Jambariki, and I hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. I would love some feedback on this new format. Do you think that this variety style is good and fun, or do you think something needs to be changed or removed or cut down a bit? Just let me know. Cheerio, folks.